I'm thrilled to have Dorian Warren with us today. Um, as we near, uh, you know, and you've heard this before, perhaps the most important election, and not just of our li lifetimes, but of our country's lifetime, as we confront a pandemic, an economic justice crisis, our democratic institutions are tested, a racial justice crisis, and I would add now a climate crisis. Mm. Um, you have in Dorian someone who is not only a bold, big thinker, but is a movement activist, a uh, long time, a strategist, a scholar. And I know he will inform and inspire you as he uh, does us at nation editorial board meetings, as he does when he takes to the airwaves. Uh, I'm, so it's, and I also am grateful to Dorian because he is the president of Community Change, which is a very important organization working with uh, low-income people of color to organize themselves, to empower themselves. And tomorrow night is their virtual annual community celebration. So some of you on this call know what that's like. I have not been to a virtual celebration, but I have been to many of Community Change's events and they are inspiring. So let me just, um, you know, um, officially president of Community Change, co-chair of the Economic Security Project, which you should learn about. As I said, a progressive scholar, organizer, uh, media personality, I could go on, trifecta doesn't do it. Uh, he taught for over a decade at the University of Chicago and Columbia University, where he was co-director of the Columbia University Program on Labor Law and Policy. Uh, he's also worked at MSNBC as a contributor and host. He, I think Melissa Harris Perry, uh, who was our longtime columnist, and we hope to be working with Dorian and Melissa more closely. You were her main you're not a substitute for anyone, but you were, and it's a good <laughs> show. And then you had your own show uh, called Nerding Out on MSNBC's digital platform, which you did. Um, Dorian serves on the boards of Working Partnerships USA, the Leadership Conference Education Fund Board, National Employment Law Project, and as I mentioned, a highly valued member of the nation's editorial board. I think you're also involved with the Roosevelt Institute in Indeed. different ways in the main. Um, so he's a commentator on too many places, politics, uh, public affairs, labor. He was also, he's doing some really deep work on childcare. Um, and, uh, you know, that's part of this time in new ways, as I think, you know, the pandemic, all of us realize has been almost like an MRI of the pre existing condition which is with this country. I would end by um, saying you're going to, it's a treat to hear Dorian. One of the reasons I enjoy listening to him is he understands the need to be in the moment, be in the present, defend, you know, and build what we have in terms of defenses for low-income people, the most vulnerable, the poor. But he also has a vision of where we, are, where we can go as a, a nation, as, a, you know, a, a world. And so um, grateful that you're joining us and turn it over to you to speak to us and then we'll have a lot of questions. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much, Katrina. Thanks to all of you for joining this conversation and my special thanks to Sarah and Peter and Gia and Aaron and of course, Katrina Vanden Heuvel. Um, just, I'm just honored to have had your friendship and support for so many years. So I'll speak for about 10 or so minutes. Um, I have lots of thoughts and then we're, I wanna be in conversation with you. And I'm gonna start from what I know best in terms of who I am and where I come from. I am, um, in my head at least, a black kid from the South Side of Chicago, raised by um, two amazing black women. My mother was a public school teacher for 40 years. I remember walking picket lines with her um, twice in the 80s. My grandmother was a janitor her entire career, one of the early members of SEIU Local One. Um, and so I've had quite a life um, that runs back through the first generation. I can actually trace my family to the first generation and experience freedom after the Civil War and doing Reconstruction and have followed them. Um, my family moved from the South, escaping, frankly, racial terrorism to find opportunity in the North in Chicago and experienced um, segregation and racism there. So I'm going to start from that standpoint of a Black American, but I will broaden out to talk about what's at stake really for all of us. Four years ago, candidate Donald J. Trump made a play for the votes of Black Americans with a very simple question. What have you got to lose? That's what he asked, us. And four years later, I would argue the verdict is very clear. Everything, 
and not only for Black Americans, but for the entire country. Since 2017, and notice I'm starting at 17, I'm not starting with 2020 and COVID-19, but since 2017, we've lost jobs, we've lost homes, we continue to do so at record numbers, not seen nor experienced for generations. Black and Latinx families are twice as likely as white families to suffer from food insecurity. We've seen a full-scale assault on voting rights, on reproductive freedom, and on the First Amendment right to protest. Trump has reversed crucial gains achieved for LGBTQ people and full-throatedly incited violence against Black and Brown communities, whether by law enforcement or by white nationalists. This administration has waged a particularly aggressive war against immigrants by rolling out policy after policy um, since 2017 that systematically targets immigrant communities in the US. He's relied on racist tropes deployed for decades by both parties, I might be quick to add. Mm -hmm. And our communities have undergone a nationwide racist, violent backlash directed from the highest office in the land. We have all joined the rest of the country in watching fundamental norms and institutions of US democracy start to collapse before our eyes. And then of course, COVID-19 hit our shores earlier this year. And so many of us have lost grandparents and mothers and fathers and siblings and extended family members and coworkers and friends and neighbors to a virus that frankly other rich countries have figured out with smart evidence-based competent governance how to contain. So I can go on, <laughs> um, but I wanna pivot to what we have not lost. And what we have not lost in black and brown communities, yes, white working class and middle class communities, what we've not lost is our moral clarity, our determination and our dignity. Our moral clarity around a vision of substantive justice and freedom is as strong as ever. Thanks in no small part to the continuing journalistic coverage and sharp analysis of The Nation magazine. So thanks to all of you for supporting and continuing to support this magazine founded by abolitionists. We are all clear that the Trump campaign is pursuing a re-election strategy of aggressive racism, drawing on the deep racial resentment of Trump's base. We are clear that a wide range of enablers, let me emphasize that, enablers have cast their lot with Trumpism over the last four years, but frankly, with the conservative movement over the last four decades. And we also know that we have plenty of work to do within the Democratic Party, even as we're all coming together to defeat Trump in November. And I like to point out that oppressive structures in America know no party. So it's our determination to achieve true freedom and justice that's just as strong as my ancestors experienced um, after the first light of freedom, after emancipation, only to see it go away, only to see it dissipate under Jim Crow authoritarianism for a century before the hard won civil rights victories of the 1960s. Our determination is just as strong as our parents and our grandparents, for those of us who maybe um, have ancestors that weren't born here, but our parents and grandparents who made the hard decisions to uproot their lives, to make the journey to the US, to be united with their families or to seek new families, to seek safety, jobs, education, often fleeing political or economic conditions in their home countries created by decades of our US foreign and trade policies. So all that to say, we are determined to make 2020 a turning point in the history of this country. Trump declared, as you might remember, with his presidential bid, he started with strategic racism. And he started his bid by saying, quote, when Mexico sends its people, they're not sending their best, they're bringing drugs, they're bringing crime, they're rapists. Two years later, to remind you, in response to the violent and tragic white nationalist rally in Charlottesville, then President Trump declared that there were, quote, very fine people on both sides. By making strategic racism explicit and undeniable at the highest levels of governing power, Trump has reawakened not just Black Americans, but all Americans' core belief that voting matters and that elections have consequences. This realization, I would argue from my standpoint, builds on the collective memory in Black communities of what I would just simply name as white supremacist authoritarian rule in the Jim Crow South for over 100 years that the fundamental fight for the right to vote in a democracy was key to defeating what was homegrown authoritarianism and one party rule. And in fact, we know from some political science research that the threat of racial authoritarianism is under some conditions, actually a strong motivator for many black voters, not for all voters, but for lots of voters, it actually is a, a strong motivator. Trump has made America's structurally racist foundation plain for all to see 
by turning racial dog whistles, what we used to call dog whistles in 2015 and 2016, he's turned them into desperate bullhorns, mm -hmm. ripping away the thin veneer that was always clear to black folks and communities of color based on lived experience. There is evidence that an increasingly growing number can clearly see that in the words of Isabel Wilkerson, caste is the bones, race is the skin, and that 45, this president is weaponizing race to hold onto power. So it's in this context that we all have to be determined to realize at last the full promise of citizenship, not just for black Americans, but for citizens and immigrants alike. We have to expand the circle of belonging in America. And because we just celebrated Labor Day, we have to be determined to realize that all workers across race, across gender, across ability, must be able to realize the full promise of economic citizenship or as Franklin Delano Roosevelt once proclaimed, the full economic bill of rights that every resident in this country deserves. Let me pivot to just talk about the current moment because we have been led by a new generation of activists in the movement for black lives that have inspired millions of people across race, across gender and across generation to take to the streets in record numbers this summer to create what the New York Times described as the largest social movement in history. And by doing so, they and we have collectively forced Americans to make a choice between militant ignorance or deep solidarity to advance racial and economic justice. The question of the moment is simply, to use the old labor movement song, which side are you on? Trump has created or exacerbated countless crises. There are too many to name, public health, economic, racial injustice, governance, democracy itself. He's exacerbated and created these crises and it's clarified what's at stake, not just in this election, but what's at stake over the next decade and the next several generations. We have collectively centered the debate in this summer around racialized police and state violence, around housing and segregation, and frankly, around exclusion and exploitation inherent in the rules of our system of racial capitalism. This Recentering in this conversation we're in the midst of also includes alternatives, and you can read about them every week in the nation pages. A fundamental reimagining of what we want our collective futures to look like. Now, none of this means that we are destined to win in November. So the question is, how do we translate the summer of 2020, the summer of mass collective action, into a powerful and enduring new electoral coalition? How do we extend the movement moment into a movement for governing power for transformation. And as we already know, we are not guaranteed to win transformative policy change at any level, whether local, state, or national, even if Trump leaves office in January. We're not guaranteed to win transformative policy changes. But I would argue we're starting to see the seeds of a new future. Um, this summer, tens of municipalities um, have responded quickly to defund police and reinvest those resources into much needed community services. Over the last several years, hundreds of municipalities have said if they refuse to collaborate with the Department of Homeland Security to detain and deport immigrants. And while uh, many of the protests that are still ongoing have not been consistently covered by the national media, with the exception of the nation, these victories, I wanna say to you, provide momentum for grassroots organizers and ordinary people to keep up the fight, to build power collectively, and ultimately to bring in a new transformative moment in this country. Trump succeeded the first black president whom he despised by enabling a resurgent wave of populist white nationalism. And as Jacob Hacker and um, Paul Pearson write in their recent book, Let Them Eat Tweets, they fuse populist white nationalism with what they call plutocratic motivations. Mm. But this wasn't Trump's doing alone. I wanna remind us of this as I start to close. We are witnessing the culmination of a 40 year plus conservative movement and Republican party strategy for minority rule and oligarchic rule. The entire premise of the modern conservative movement has been to repeal the 20th century. Mm -hmm. Whether the right to vote for women, the New Deal, the civil rights movement, they wanna repeal it all. And so by unleashing and riding this resurgent wave of populist white nationalism with plutocracy at the, at the bottom of it, Trump and his enablers, I would argue, have ushered in a potential third reconstruction moment for us all. The third reconstruction that's been so eloquently articulated by the great Reverend Barber. Um, we might be experiencing another reconstruction faster than we would have otherwise.
And as I have had the pleasure to write in the Nation pages um, with my good friend and colleague, Sibyl Rachman of Demos, the third reconstruction should be, it should be the defining um, uh, frame for this decade of the 2020s, the defining way in which we end our racial caste system, which Trump sits atop. And I think it's already underway. If you look at the movement for black lives, if you look at the social justice ecosystem, we are all more sophisticated and strategic than ever. And the question is, what do we have to lose in this moment? I would say everything. But what do we have to win in this moment? I would say everything. <laughs> a giant leap forward for racial justice and freedom for all. Let me close by just saying a bit about, um, and Sasha Abramsky wrote about this yesterday in The Nation, but many of us have engaged in intensive scenario planning to prepare for the outcome of the November elections. We are preparing for three potential governing scenarios. A Trump re-election, which is very possible, depending on what we all do. A ready to govern scenario in the event of democratic control of the House, the Senate, and the White House. And of course, there's a scenario in which Biden wins the presidency, but the Republicans retain control of the Senate. A lot of us are also anticipating a contested election. And so we've been coordinating and there are lots of formations out there, but there is a real possibility that we come out of a contested election scenario with our power depleted as a movement, even if Biden ultimately takes office in January. So we have to grapple with that question of how to avoid that kind of an outcome as a movement. And how do we all prepare ourselves with what might be a replay of the, for those of you old enough to remember, what might be a replay of the 2000 election. Finally, as I see it, um, there's lots of opportunity in the multiple crises we've been living through. I think there's an opportunity to organize and recruit new people into our movement in an unprecedented way in this moment. I think there's an opportunity to push for bold ideas to solve our most intractable problems. I think this is, could be a moment, um, I'm very hopeful and optimistic, this could be a moment for transformational, not incremental policy change. As always, it's taken the combination of very slow and often invisible work of grassroots organizing over many years and many decades. I think of grassroots organizing as sort of plate tectonics. It's the slow moving shifts in our country that you don't see. And then we have political earthquake moments that can lead to transformative shifts. And I think our role in this moment is to extend this political earthquake moment in which we're all living through for as long as possible because frankly, our lives and our communities are depending on it. So I'll close there and really just open it up. I'm really eager to get in the conversation with all of you. Dorian, thank you for that brilliant um, sense of how we go from this moment, this movement moment to a governing moment, if we can. Uh, your deeply personal insights, your deeply historically informed insights, um, and your sense always that um, there's a history here. You talked about the 40 year history William Grider, who wrote for us for mm. years, mm. wrote a piece during the Bush years called Repealing the 20th Century. And I think that is worth thinking about as is, and I'm gonna turn it over to Aaron, how we are in a possible moment of third reconstruction and how we can go and you know, build this extraordinary um, movement energy that we've seen into a governing moment so that there's a sense of lasting energy and power and transformation, because it's not guaranteed, you know. Um, and I hope we'll come back to talking about the different scenarios and what we can do, both at the nation and as a nation, to contest a contested election and also possibly just to have a landslide and a Senate. That's right. Which would be extraordinary. So thank you very much for giving us a context, an extraordinary context for understanding where we are. And I'll turn it over to Aaron. Hi, um, it, so I, I just want to let you know that for some reason my internet connection seems a little unstable today. So if I pop out, I seem to be popping right back in. Um, so I'll be back. It's not purposeful. Um, Doreen, I want to build on the idea of trans the transformation, the movements, and something else you said, which is the, the question is, which side are you on? So mm. when you're thinking about these transformational mo moments and these movements, is it is it possible to convince people who aren't on the side of transformation to join? Is that, do you have focus there or is the, is the focus to energize the, the people who are already answering that question? 
Aaron, I'm from, as I mentioned, and all of you know, I wear it on my sleeve. I'm from Chicago, and um, one of my favorite places in Chicago is Second City Improv. Uh. The most numbers of Saturday Night Live cast members out of which they've come. Um, and one of the first things you, know, you learn in improv is not to do either or, but it's often yes and. So I think it's yes and. I think we need a strategy, and many of us are working on a strategy to energize the base, to recruit those that already agree with us, that are already nation readers, to get people to take more action. And leading up to election day, on election day, of course, and after election day, we can't just go home after we vote. We have to stay engaged. But any good organizer would tell you that's never enough. We have to persuade and challenge and talk to people that don't agree with us. But, but who we, we have to walk with confidence that we actually share some fundamental values and that we can, I used to be a union, organize, union organizer for a couple of years in Chicago um, with hotel workers. And any union organizer would tell you, you can't just talk to workers and if they say, no, I'm not gonna vote for the union, then you go home and that's the end. You actually have to keep at it. You have to keep knocking on doors. You have to keep having very challenging and hard conversations. And that's the process of organizing of talking both to our champions and people that we that already agree with us but also we have to constantly expand the circle we are not big enough <laughs> we're not big enough i am confident that we're going to win in a landslide um if it was actually if it was a normal election right if there wasn't cheating and stealing at play because i do think the numbers are on our side but we can't take that for granted and actually that's what the democratic party does way too often they decide two weeks before the election oh my goodness we need to go into black and brown communities um, and put a little money in to get people to turn out when they should have been having the conversation, the party through party structures for the last four years or 40 years. And so it's the job of organizers and organizations to have these ongoing conversations with people who agree with us, people who don't agree with us, but can be persuaded that it, their fates are linked to our fates. I think that's how we win. So I see it, that's a long way of saying, it's a yes and, it's sort of all of the above, right? It's, it's an all hands on deck moment too. And, the evidence shows this summer, there have been more people that have taken to the streets than any time in which we have been alive. Um, and if you look at the images and the video of who has been at protests day after day since Memorial Day, it is not just black people, it's not just brown people. There are a lot of white people, there are people of all genders. Um, this, is, this is a turning point in our country. And I do think, um, I do think we can win mm -hmm. and we can win big, not just incremental change. Uh, Grace has a question. She wonders, how can we make this a clear call to stop Trump destroying our democracy, our press, our elections, our rights? Um, she says, how can we make this a call across racial lines for true democracy, equality, and moral integrity? Oh, well, I'd love um, your thoughts and Katrina's thoughts too on this. I mean, I think, I think, I think a lot of us let me let me say it this way. I, I was trained as a social scientist. I used to be a practicing political scientist. And um, that means I was trained with a certain amount of skepticism among anyone who claims they have all the answers. So I'm not going to claim I have all the answers. But I do think what's the beauty of this democracy is we've always been experimental. And so I want to bring an experimental lens to this um, conversation of we should be trying out different things. We should be trying out different moral visions. We should be trying out different frames in how we understand the world. I'll give you a, an example to try to, un, to try to unpack your question a little bit. Um, there's this thing called the race class narrative um, that a few of our fr progressive friends who have written in these pages of the nation have talked about. And the idea was um, in contrast to say 30 years of, of liberal messaging in the Democratic Party, that said, don't talk about race, it's divisive. Just talk about economics and all the things that unite us. This race class narrative said, no, we're gonna actually try a different perspective. We're gonna name race, and we're gonna name what the top 1% does with race, how they use it to divide us. And then we're gonna emphasize the values that we all share and why we all have to come together across race to defeat those that would seek to divide us. We're no more shirking, no more running away from race, and for that matter, gender. We have to put it on the table. And they didn't just say, okay, this is our theory. And so everyone should come along for the ride. They actually tested it out in places. They've tested it out in Minnesota and Wisconsin and Midwestern states. And in fact, 
white people and white working class folks, when you say, hey, this is what Trump is doing to divide us, or this is what other Trump enablers are doing to divide us by race, and this is our collective vision and how we have to come together to win, people come, up, people come to our side. It's actually very persuasive. So that's a way of saying we have to, exp no one has all the strategies, but if we can experiment with some things and test it empirically and see how we do, that gives us more confidence. Okay, the race class narrative worked really well in Minnesota. It might look a little different in Arizona, but let's go test it out there. So that's how I would come at the question of wherever you live, you know your community best. You know what, what are the rock solid values in your community and what moves people, um, your neighbors, your friends. Just try, try some things, see what works. Um, it is an all hands, this is what the Movement for Black Lives reminds us of, it's an all hands on deck moment in this country. So we need everybody engaged, um, no matter where you come from, no matter your race or gender, we need everybody engaged in whatever way you know how. So building on that, um, what should Biden and Harris campaign do to energize the most activist generation in history? What, what's, what should their all hands strategy be? Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, there's going to be in lots of trouble here. I think, um, let me come at it this way. My favorite president, and Katrina, don't get mad at me, I love Franklin Delano Roosevelt. I'm, yeah, yeah, Illinois, I'm really so, angry. I'm really so angry. I love, I love, I love, you know, Abraham Lincoln. They were flawed people, but amazing leaders. My favorite president is Lyndon Baines Johnson. My favorite, why he's my favorite president is because if you look at his record before he assumes the presidency, it was quite mixed. He actually helped to block some needed labor law reforms in the 50s. He actually, um, you know, he was a New Deal Democrat, but on race, eh, before he took over, questionable. Um, we know all the things he said based on White House transcripts um, in his crude language. But why he's my favorite president is because he understood the moment in which he found himself. And he understood it was a movement moment and that he had to rise to become a champion. And he was pushed really hard. And you could say the same about FDR as well. And so I would say to the Biden-Harris team, understand the moment you're in. Yep. This is much more like 1932 or um, 1964. And there's, not, there's no perfect analogy, by the way. This is a movement moment. And this requires extraordinary leadership. And it couldn't be clearer in this moment. This is not a return to normalcy because the previous normal before COVID-19 wasn't so good for working class people and low income people and black and brown people um, it, and, women, and women of color. It just wasn't, normal wasn't good. So let's, let's actually go forth in the future with a very bold vision. And then it's up to people like me and all of us to really put the pressure on them, um, to challenge them to step up into their leadership. So, so that's, I'm not evading the question, you know, they're going to do what they're going to do when they have a whole bunch of Democratic consultants around them. From a movement perspective, our job is to push them to be their, their best selves, so to speak. I know that sounds cliche. Um, and not be, and let's also remember the lessons of the Obama years. Let's remember the lessons, you know, we all, a lot of us went home after the 2008 election. And those of us that went home, I would argue, we, like a lot of good things happen, um, the Economic Recovery Act, um, the Affordable Care Act, but the people that kept the pressure on, and I'm thinking of gay people, I'm thinking of immigrants and particularly dreamers, the people that said, Mr. President, we're gonna protest you anyway, when he said that he, there was no relief for immigrants and for dreamers, they kept protesting and engaging in civil disobedience to say, yes, you actually can do more, and he did it, and he did it. Um, we saw this with the wave of elections, and then I'll close here, of black mayors in the 70s and 80s, where a lot of us were excited by having black faces in high places, and then everybody went home and didn't keep the pressure on to hold our elected officials accountable, because anybody in positions of power can be corrupted, even if they're our friends. So we have to be really clear. I'm, I'm actually reminded often I grew up in Chicago, as you've heard me say, and I spent my teenage years um, going to Operation Push headquarters on Saturday mornings for Reverend Jackson's Saturday morning forums. And I would just go by myself as a teenager. And so I was very much steeped in um, the Rainbow Coalition politics, which Reverend Jackson learned from the Harold Washington election in 1983. 
where Harold Washington, who was a progressive, progressive black mayor, brought together for the first time a winning governing coalition of black people, of Latinx folks, particularly Puerto Ricans and Mexicans and progressive whites. And that's how Jesse got the idea for the Rainbow Coalition. The fear I have now is that we could become a rainbow oligarchy. Interesting. Because of corporate power, because of moneyed interest. And so we have to remain sober and clear that just because there are faces that look like ours in positions of power doesn't mean we keep the heat off. We have to keep the heat on and make sure that we hold our elected officials accountable and back our champions and back our champions. <laughs> so that was a wide ranging, that was a little windy comment and reflection, but, um, but um, it's all hands on deck. Use whatever you can to convince your friends and neighbors um, that moves them in terms of the core values we all share. And let's stay sober about what's needed in this next period. Um, an anonymous attendee is wondering about, um, you know, people who believe all lives matter and use that slogan. They say, what would you say to a white working class, white working class folks who say, hey, all lives matter, not just black lives matter. How would you challenge them? How would you teach them? Um, it depends on the person. And I do believe part of the, the magic of organizing is actually having a trusted relationship with someone who might not agree with you. It's one thing for me as a stranger to give advice. It's another thing for you to talk to that person that knows you well mm -hmm. and to start from a place of shared values and then to challenge. And so one, you know, there's two kinds of conversations I can imagine happening. Just take a look at, and you should read Dave Zirin in these pages or listen to his podcast. Look at what's happened in the NFL just in the last six months. To go from blacklisting, blacklisting um, Cap, right? Colin Kaepernick, Kaepernick, I always get his name wrong, sorry Cap. Um, to go from blacklisting his entire career for doing something as patriotic as kneeling to now, as I read yesterday, the end zones of NFL football games are going to have racial justice messaging. Yeah. That's, that's fast change. And so we have to ask ourselves, what, how did that change happen and why? So there's, there's one way to point someone to say, okay, there's lots of changes happening. And I know it's unstable, maybe. Um, there's another path that I would argue really comes back to our linked fate. And it comes um, to this concept that I learned years ago from Lonnie Guineer. Um, and Gerald Torres, they wrote this amazing book, both um, law professors, mm -hmm. and they wrote this book called The Miner's Canary, and why race in America, and particularly if you look at black people in America, how we kind of serve as the miner's canary for American democracy. And the story of the miner's canary quickly is that for mine workers who are working in very dangerous mine mines, they would take canaries, right, on their shoulders. Um, as the image goes, because canaries' lungs were so small. So when there were toxic gases in the mines, canaries would get sick and maybe die. The mine workers knew to get out. That's basically Black people on American democracy. And so if you look at why Black lives matter, it's because in many ways Black people are one. And I would say there are several miners' canaries in our democracy. It's not just Black people. It's immigrants. It's women. It's, it's workers. It's queer people, it's disabled people. It's, we're all minors canary based on where we sit in terms of advantage and disadvantage. And so to make the finish the point, if you go back to the reconstruction period, reconstruction after the civil war, the full name was to reconstruct our democracy. And what we saw in the South, when the Freedmen's Bureau was assigned to rebuild the South, to reconstruct the South, it was the first time that public schools were built. And those public schools in the South benefited not just former slaves who were black, they benefited poor white people too. That was the first time that poor whites across the South had a chance for public education and a chance for class mobility, but it was rooted in the freedom of black people. And so that's what Black Lives Matter means to me. And I think if you can start a conversation that, that points to, okay, who are the miners canaries of our democracy? that point to some of the structural problems we have that affect us all, that don't just affect black people or don't just affect women or don't just affect black women, but affect us all. And if we can solve for those, how might we all benefit? How might we all get collective goods? Solving climate change, mm 
creating adequate and accessible childcare for everybody in the midst of a pandemic, creating a different kind of economy for all of us. If you look at the plight of essential workers who are the miners canary in this period, risking their lives to go to work for us um, to be able to help feed, create the food that we eat. So I would, that's how I would come at it in terms of linked fate. How are our fates linked? What are the values we share? How are different um, groups of us miners canary for some elements of American democracy? And why it benefits us all when we all pitch in around racial and economic justice. So that's how I would shift from an all lives matter to black lives matter or a shorter way of saying it is the way, if you really believe all lives matter, the way you get there is through black lives matter. Uh, thank you. Um, I, I wonder if you can talk a bit about uh, Trump's campaign strategy of law and order and some of the images of violence that we're seeing in protests. Uh, Clara says, um, I'm worried Trump is gaining support because of the violence in some protests and wonders if there's any way to curb the pent up anger that causes violence. Um. Oh, <laughs> this, is, this is a meaty one. Um, a lot of people have been of a certain age, I would add, um, including myself, have been thinking a lot about 1968 and how Nixon, and that's how the Trump campaign is thinking. Um, and if you think of Trump world, he and his cronies, if you think of Roger Stone or Paul Manafort, you know, there's a, there's a, you can connect the dots. There's a straight line from Nixon all the way to Trump. And so, yes, a law and order Nixon type campaign is exactly what they're banking on because it's no longer a dog whistle. So it's a way to say, hey, look at all those criminal black people out there. Aren't they scary? Vote for me and I'll restore order. I do think the Biden campaign, frankly, has done a good job of saying, um, how is he going to save you from disorder if that's on his watch? Like this is now. This is not in the future. <laughs> this is under his watch. That's one. Two is, um, I think there's an outdated notion in a, of who, who lives in suburbs in particular. There is a notion, and Trump has said this very explicitly, in trying to scare his image of white suburban mothers, mm -hmm. whether it's around affordable housing in suburbs or around crime and disorder. And that picture is outdated because that's not who the suburbs are anymore. Our suburbs have changed radically in the last two decades, and they are much more racially diverse. There's still segregation to be sure, but that image that somehow there's just, you know, massive millions of numbers of white suburban moms, and it just excludes black and brown people who live in suburbs, it's a bit wrong. So I think strategically it's wrong. <laughs> and, um, and I also think it's just a different moment. You know, there was lots of disorder in 1932 as well, one could argue in that election um, because of an economic depression. The, and there was disorder, that it was, there were protests that were framed as disorder. Always be on the watch out for First Amendment protests that are nonviolent to be framed as somehow lawlessness. And because um, what we're not seeing in many cities across this country, there have been protests every single day since Memorial Day. That is not, if it's, you know, the news, the news business is if it, if it bleeds, it leads. That is right, and so it hasn't been bleeding. So we haven't been seeing it, but there have been sustained protests across this country that if you read our pages here at The Nation, you understand. So I would just say, um, let's be careful to push back. We have to push back forcefully against the frame and protect people's fundamental rights to protest um, injustice. I do think there's a way in which the notion that law and order is gonna work in 2020 in the same way it did in 1968 is very outdated. And you know, this will be the big test in, on election day. I, I do think we are on the cusp of what we saw the beginnings of in November of 2018. People describe the November 2018 midterm elections as a blue wave. I do think we're in the cusp of a blue tsunami and my sense is that the internal polling of Trump world knows this is to be true. And that is why they're so explicitly rigging the rules and cheating and race baiting very explicitly. You don't screw with the post office. You don't try to delegitimize the election ahead of time if you know you're gonna lose. Um, and so we have to, I think, keep focused. There are lots of people that are figuring out what's the right messaging to do in terms of combating Trump's law and order. 
I think we have to be bold and confident and say protest is a fundamental American tradition from the revolution to the present. Um, every single movement in this country has engaged in protest to mark transformation and the force transformation in this country. Um, and the way to, and yes, if there is crime, which is in every single community <laughs> in this country, the way to solve for that is to provide the basic necessities for every American in this country, whether it's housing, food on the table, a good job that pays livable wages. We actually know how to solve these problems. That is not up for debate. We can debate strategy, but we know a lot about how to solve these fundamental problems. Uh, thank you. Uh, Laurel Hurden uh, has a question about Flint specifically. Um, she asks, who on the left, in addition to Michael Moore, is talking about the need for Biden to reject the endorsement of Rick Schneider, the Michigan governor, who at best turned his back on the people of Flint and perhaps at worst was an architect of their crisis. And, you know, that's, it's interesting too, because the crisis in Flint is not new. So how does Biden handle that? Well, um, I, hear, I hear the frustration in that question and the anger. It's, it is enraging because frankly, former Governor Snyder was never held accountable for crimes that were committed. Let me just say it very bluntly like that. Um, I'm not, honestly, I'll just say, I'm not interested in getting into a debate whether Biden should refuse that endorsement. Like we're not gonna change his mind <laughs> on that. Um, and I would rather spend my energy organizing in the state of Michigan to create, create a resounding victory, um, not just for the top of the ticket, but the bottom of the ticket for the people that can hold former Governor Snyder and all the other enablers around the Flint water crisis. How do we hold them accountable? I think that's the question. And there is very, very good leadership now in the state of Michigan that I would wanna put pressure on, um, whether it's Governor Whitmer, um, there's a very sharp progressive black Lieutenant Governor named Garland Gilchrist in the state of Michigan who is from Detroit and cares a lot about what's happened in Flint. And so how do we enable champions in that state? How do we stay focused on say, um, state attorney generals and secretaries of states and um, local prosecutors that can actually hold those accountable for the crimes committed against the residents of Flint and many other places across this country of people that still don't have clean water to this day. So I, I would redirect around how do we provide accountability for those formerly elected officials? And then what is the path forward? What does a clean water system look like? Um, because the cameras went away from Flint, except for a few of us like on this call, right? There's, we, what's the latest update on Flint? Not a lot of people know. And there's still mass suffering and harm in Flint to this day. So I would redirect to figure out how to focus on the bottom of the ticket in addition to the top of the ticket. Um, Anne Martin has a question about community change. Um, she says, I'm fascinated by your community change organization, particularly as it might be working to bring people not necessarily associated with environmental action. Mm. It seems natural that those who experience the disproportionate effects of climate and other environmental adverse effect would be natural allies. Um, so what are you doing or are you doing to um, bring these communities into environmental actions? Uh, I would say, so we work at Community Change, we work with about 200 grassroots organizations around the country in all 50 states. And many of our grassroots partners have been in the climate movement or the climate justice movement forever. So it's for us, it's, we don't see it as separate um, in terms of what our grassroots part, the work of our grassroots partners what our role is, is in some ways is to do movement alignment. So we've been very, very close to some of our national climate justice partners, whether it's the People's Climate March or Sierra Club, et cetera. And, um, and I get this idea actually from Mary Kay Henry of SEIU. A lot of us have been trying to think about what is a fusion, and we get it also from Reverend Barber. What does fusion politics look like? This is something Reverend Barber pioneered in North Carolina. How do we bring our movements what are, that are often in issue silos, how do we fuse them together? And so when um, we were doing mass mobilizations around the immigrant rights movement in 2017, um, in 2018, and even before, you know who stood right by us was Sierra Club and New Consensus and a range of other um, climate justice organizations. 
And it created a sense of solidarity so that we now know to show up when there's a climate march or to, you know, we're going to have a whole debate in 2021 if we can get Trump out of office. What are going to be the big issues in the first 100 days? And how are we going to negotiate around economic recovery, rescinding all the bad things Trump did, and frankly, a Green New Deal? Mm -hmm. How do we tie our things together so that we're not in our issue silos, um, but are actually doing this kind of fusion politics so that climate justice and immigrant rights and racial justice and gender justice are all tied together in everything we do? So that was a long-winded way of saying, um, at Community Change, we still have, I'll just say bluntly, we have a lot more work to do in terms of the climate justice movement. We've been getting much closer to some of our national partners, but our grassroots partners have been there all along. When it was called, you know, the environmental racism in the 80s and 90s, we were there and supporting our grassroots partners in that work before um, there was, within the climate justice movement, actually a lot of work done around racial justice over the last decade. So there's still more work that all of us have to do to do this fusion politics across all our issues. Um, there, this is an energized audience, as you might guess. Um, <laughs> Uh, Marjorie Harrison wrote in the chat that um, she's been doing phone banking on behalf of Democratic candidates to Republican-leaning voters, and the and the persuasion that you were describing, she says, is is happening, which is great to hear. Um, and then Jordan Weltman is asking, you know, where are the most important places or elections to put the our our, our audience's virtual get out the vote efforts in the next weeks. Oh, wow. So I, that's helpful. Thank you. That's helpful that for the person doing the calls um, that it's working. You know, I think there's two quick things to say. One is, you know, we know the, the 12 roughly battleground states. Um, so if you want to plug in, there's lots of efforts um, to plug you into that can do phone banking. But I have a different suggestion here. This is my second point. But there's like 12 battleground states. There are also some states that I think will surprise many people that might be in play. Georgia, Texas, obviously North Carolina, um, Arizona for sure, Michigan, Wisconsin, you know, these are Nevada, Florida, 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 <laughs> Wisconsin. Um, but here's the thing, here's what we know um, in a decade of research and practice in elections. The Democratic Party still does a thing of flying people in two weeks in advance and having strangers knock on doors. It's always better to talk to people in your social network because you are trusted messengers. You're trustworthy. So even if you have a friend or a coworker or a neighbor who doesn't agree with you, they would be willing to have a more likely to have a conversation with you in good faith than a stranger who knocks at their door. And so I would encourage you to look through your own, you know, look through your phone in terms of who's in your address book and then look and see what state they're in. I would go through your address book first and make sure that your friends are registered, that they um, have all, that they, all the information they need in terms of early voting or vote by mail or what to do on election day. And especially if they're in a battleground state, continuing to have conversations and to hold your friends and you know, peer pressure works people. Peer pressure works. You keep pressuring your friends and family members Hey, did you vote yet? Is your state early voting? Did you vote yet? Keep pressuring them. That actually works more than, um, and I'm not diminishing any of you who are doing calls to strangers. We still need that work too. But I would start with your immediate social network. Um, look on your Facebook page. Talk to all those folks. That is the way to magnify our impact is through the social networks of people that we know in some way who might trust us better than a stranger. Um, I just want to, I want to ask one more question and I'll turn it over to Katrina to close since we're coming to the end of our hour and this has really been extraordinary. I'm so grateful for your time. Um, so thank you. Uh, in your opening remarks, you said that what we need to do is expand the circle of belonging in America. Um, which is extraordinary. And I wonder what signs of hope and movement toward that goal you see. Um, well, uh, Mariam Kaba, I think I'm saying their name right, reminds us that hope is a discipline. 
it's a discipline and we have to work at it. And I think the fight that we're in right now is fundamentally about who we are as a country and whether we will be an exclusionary country or one of belonging. And that has been a fight in this country since the very beginning. Who belongs and who doesn't? Who has rights and who doesn't? And so I do think, as I mentioned earlier, we are, we're in the midst of the largest social movement in American history. And we choose to fight for an America where our freedom and dignity for all of us isn't a radical idea. And I am reminded, frankly, of the great John Lewis, the Honorable John Lewis, who um, departed us earlier this summer. But, you know, in his final written words in the New York Times, he wrote that ordinary people with extraordinary vision can redeem the soul of America by getting in what he called good trouble and necessary trouble. And so I do think this is our historic fight that we actually owe it to our ancestors who either came here by choice um, or not. I do think this is the fundamental core fight of who we are as a country. And we have had periods of two steps forward where we've been expansive and inclusionary and periods of three and four steps backwards where we've been restrictionist and have um, uh, closed our borders. And so uh, it, it is a constant fight. I don't know how else to say it, Aaron, um, except to say that if I can trace my family back seven generations and there are some people who are fighting for me to have relative freedom to what they had in the 1860s, we owe it to ourselves in this moment we owe it to our children and our grandchildren, and we owe it to seven generations in front of us to fight the fight so that freedom and dignity and belonging is no longer a radical idea, but is the new norm, and that we actually literally save the planet. Jordan, um, I'm not sure what to say. I'm almost speechless, but um, I wanted to say um, that you've reminded us with your powerful words of what's at stake, why this is a all hands on deck moment. And I would say for in the tradition of most people we've had on these conversations, I'm reminded of Eric Foner, mm. who reminded us that it's been a constant struggle. It's a struggle, it's a contested politics history uh, and that freedom and democracy are not an inevitability. Yes. It's a choice. And I think we are confronted with that choice now. And that we go, we vote, we elect, but we don't go home. And we don't go home for all the reasons you suggest because this is a movement moment. This is a moment of extraordinary power and potential. There's seeds of a new future, but uh, there's also, there are seeds of a dark future if we don't step up, all of us in our own ways, as you've reminded all the engaged participants on this call of what they can do and people need to engage. And I would simply, I had not heard hope is a discipline. I like that very mm. much. I will do a Biden, uh, Seamus Haney. <laughs> yes. <laughs> hope, hope uh, you know, hope is not rosy optimism. It's work that needs to be done. And he put it more eloquently, I'm not an Irish poet. But um, I think we're in that time. And I also want to uh, thank you for being on the editorial board, for giving us your insights. Uh, this, I'm going to go, go, go back and listen to. Uh, but for reminding us of why we do the work we do, of uh, reimagining a more fair, more just, more peaceful future, and alternatives. There are always alternatives in life, history, love, anyway. <laughs> but um, thank you, Dorian. And um, I know people were really energized and inspired and informed. Well, thank you, and Katrina LBJ's and team. Conversation. LBJ. It's interesting. Uh, Jesse Jackson, Reverend Jackson, comes into our office every six months, and LBJ is on his mind. And I would simply close by saying, mm -hmm. I agree with you that there is a movement there, the King, Johnson. But let us hope that what ravaged his presidency, the Vietnam War, that we take out of this pandemic the understanding we need to redefine national security. Mm -hmm. Because that could undermine so much that we need to bring home, not to be isolationist, but to rebuild and reinvest. Yes. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Katrina. Thanks to all of you at The Nation. Thanks of all of you for watching and listening. And um, let's go out there and win.